Good afternoon, and welcome to the Metropolitan Planning Council. My name is Audrey Wenink, and I'm the Director of Transportation here, and we're thrilled to have such a full room to have a vibrant conversation about transit in Chicago. So just a few notes of housekeeping up front. Um, we want to let you know that due to the overwhelming interest in this event, we are actually live streaming it right now, as well as videotaping it, so just so, just so you're aware. Um, we ask that you please silence your electronics right now, but do keep your Twitter app open. <laughs> and um, to access restrooms, just uh, go back to where you got your name tag, get a key, um, and uh, you can use the restrooms here. If you need accessible restrooms, you can be directed to the fourth floor where there are accessible restrooms. So um, before we get into the questions, we are going to show you the world premiere of the RTA's video about Invest in Transit. Every day, two million people count on us to get to school, to work, to where they need to go, and back home again. Transit's the way to go. You don't have to sit in traffic. Fast, convenient. Without the bus, I'd be stuck. Our region is built on mass transit. The CTA Metro and Pace were created more than 70 years ago to replace private rail, streetcar, and bus companies that went bankrupt. Private investors were replaced by government investors. And despite inheriting aging equipment, inaccessible stations, worn track, and old trains, they helped the region grow into a premier hub for freight, banking, and commerce. Today, our regional transit system is the second largest in the nation. We serve Chicago and 277 municipalities in six northeastern Illinois counties. Yeah, I take the train every day to work. It's just relaxing, it just makes things easier, really. Public transit benefits all of us. It enhances lives by letting riders talk, text, read, work, or just zone out while someone else does the driving. It attracts businesses, jobs, and increases property values. Did you know that in Chicago, properties within two blocks of transit are more than twice as valuable as those further away? And public transit saves money, even if you don't ride. An average of $400 a year for rush hour drivers because it reduces the number of cars on the road. But now, it's all at risk. Our systems are large and very old. 31% of our buses and trains are beyond their useful life. Safe to ride, but costly to maintain. And aging faster than we can replace them. Doesn't the government pay for all that? In theory, however, the state hasn't passed an infrastructure bill in a decade. For years, funding has been wholly insufficient to operate and maintain your transit system. There's too little local support, state dollars are rapidly diminishing, and federal funding hasn't grown significantly for years. It's time to act. It's time to invest in transit. Investing in transit means making your rides even better with projects like an overhaul of hundreds of CTA rail cars and building a new maintenance shop to replace the one that's been in use since the 1890s. Projects like the replacement and repair of 61 Metro bridges, some made of timber that are still in use. Projects like the purchase of 412 new pace buses to replace aging ones that have reached the end of their useful life. Now that's getting our money's worth. We have big goals to deliver value on our investment, to build on the strength of our network, and to stay competitive. That's why transit needs new sources of funding. I thought fares paid for transit. You know, they just raised the fare, so I don't know where it's going. Actually, fares only cover about half of each ride. The system was designed as a public-private partnership. The plan was, because it benefits everyone, riders and taxpayers would share the cost. So each ride is funded by sales tax, the state, and a little from local governments. Problem is, those sources are not very reliable. Recent state funding cuts are one of the reasons why we've seen fare increases and service cutbacks. We need funding we can count on to keep providing the rides you depend on. With funding, we can design and build projects efficiently. Without it, projects are stalled, prices rise, and we may never leave the station. With funding, we can deliver fast and reliable service. Without it, we risk breakdowns, slowdowns, and service disruptions. Doors closing. 
And with funding, transit stays competitive. Something that's getting a lot more difficult as riders today have more and more choices. Because we need transit. It's the backbone of the Chicago region's transportation network. It's the most affordable, equitable, and dependable way to ride. It's why investing in transit must be a priority. Well, it's a priority for me. I have to get to work. For my life, it's a priority. Transit is a priority, yeah. I'd pay more if I didn't have to be packed in like this. So would I. With new funding, we can continue to do what we do best. Save you time and money, getting you where you need to go. It means planning your ride will be even easier with real-time travel information, mobile payment apps, and enhanced trip planning information, we can keep ridership growing. That's awesome. That works for me. So how much are we talking? We need a stable, dependable, dedicated annual capital investment program of two to three billion dollars per year over the next 10 years to protect and preserve the transit system you depend on. And how much are we investing now? Not even half. Not even half, wow. A new capital investment plan for the Chicago region is overdue. I don't see how we can afford not to do it. It's time. Time to act. Time to invest in transit. Because transit makes life better for all of us. All right, that was great. Uh, that makes the case. So just a couple more logistical issues. Uh, on each of your chairs, you have cards. That's how we'll take questions later. So please, as you're thinking of questions, feel free to pass them to the aisles and they'll be collected by my colleagues and brought up to me to ask the panelists. Um, in addition, um, please feel free to tweet on social media. Here are the hashtags of the transit agencies and this event has the hashtag Chai Transit Future. And that's where we'll be collecting uh, information for questions from those watching um, via live stream. And we'd also like to Thank our generous sponsors. Thank you to Chariot, STV, and WSP, who have helped make events like this uh, possible. So thank you very much. Before um, we get into um, our panel, I'd like to, and these are our panelists here who will be coming up in just a moment. Before we get into the panel, I'd like to do a few uh, slides to talk about the need for investment in transit in the region. Um, so. We actually called the Twitter feeds of CTA and Metro over the past six months to take a look at, from the user perspective, how are uh, delays trending and uh, you know, what is the user experience um, based on the ability to invest in infrastructure. So you know, we don't have pace here because they don't have as, as robust of a Twitter presence um, with their system. but. Um, what we saw was there's an average of six to seven delays related to infrastructure per day uh, on each of these systems. And we have to keep in mind that um, with CTA, when you have a delay uh, in the loop, for example, uh, it often may, an infrastructure problem, it may delay multiple trains, brown, pink, green, um, purple in the loop. So it's really affecting a lot more trains than it may seem. And with Metro, when there's, for example, a track problem at rush hour, it may affect multiple trains running on that same line. So we recognize that Twitter is not a scientific review of asset management systems, but this just gives a user, um, user facing perspective on how this is affecting people's experience every day. And what is the cause? Um, you can see these are some of the categories that the transit agencies use. Mechanical, door problems, signal switch problems, track obstruction, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, when you look at the share of overall delays that are attributable to mechanical problems, um, and these can be fixed by investment. Um, as you heard, 31% of the rolling stock in our system is past its useful life. And so investment can help reduce these numbers of delays. So for CTA, more than half of delays, according to Twitter, um, are related to mechanical problems. And for Metra, 
uh, nearly two thirds are related to mechanical problems. And so while the transit agencies do an absolutely great job with the funding that they have, and we very much appreciate them using communications tools like Twitter to communicate with their riders, um, we must recognize that we are already seeing the impacts of this insufficient funding on our rider experience. And so it's really critical to sustainably fund our system. So now, um, let's begin to get into our conversation. So I'd like, to invent, uh, I'd like to invite our four speakers to come up to the front of the room, and we are going to um, get the light out of your eyes. Uh, so come on up, please, and have a seat up at the front of the room. Mm -hmm. We, we are so pleased um, today to have the four executives of our transit agencies here today in one room. Um, this does not happen very often. We are thrilled to have Leanne Redden, the executive director of the Regional Transportation Authority. Uh, I'm trying to go in, in order here on, in the front. Um, TJ Ross, the executive director of PACE. Dorval Carter, the president of the Chicago Transit Authority, and Jim Derwinski, the CEO and executive director of Metra. So thank you so much for being here. And I will get, uh, we will get into, uh, I'm glad, Re Leanne, I see you switching on your microphone. Experienced panelists there. Um, so please do switch on your microphones. And now we'd like to give each of this, the panelists a, uh, a few, moments to give introductory statements and then we'll get into questions. Go ahead, Leanne. Sure, thanks for watching the video. That was our world premiere. We even have a really cool trailer to go with it. But uh, I think it succinctly makes the case. We put a strategic plan together, but the odds are people aren't actually gonna read even a compelling document. So it's good to have something that's a little more sort of uh, palatable across the, the region. One thing that I, I want to sort of set the tone on in some of the conversations, that the current funding structure that we have, both on the operating and the capital side, is not sustainable. And we really are at a critical juncture where we ha something has to give, something has to change. We know that the state is not in any great f fiscal shakes itself. And so what are we going to do as a region to really think about how do we move forward? We are lucky enough to have one of the, the second largest transit network in the country, but it is big and it is old. And that presents some opportunities, but some really huge challenges, the two to three billion dollars a year that we need to be investing in transit. And I think we have to be very mindful about talking about this, not in terms of just sort of building bridges and roads and tunnels and tracks and structures, but more about the reason to invest in our infrastructure. This is not a handout. This, is a this delivers a return on investment that really drives this state's economy. And I think if we acknowledge that, I think it helps in our conversation advancing the, the issues mm -hmm. forward and making our case for investment. And can I just ask the speakers, please keep the microphone really close um, to your mouth so that we can hear you well. Thank you. TJ, you want to go next? Um, obviously, we're here to talk about capital and the impact that it has on our operating expenses. Uh, when I came here 20 years ago, we shortly after that, we got a capital plan out of the state and uh, did a lot of good things. And then about 10 years ago, we did about the same. And now we're uh, once again in a position where we need to do capital. PACE has done really everything we, we can do to live without a capital program. Over the last 10 years, we've basically moved uh, uh, about $100 million worth of operating funding that would traditionally be, traditionally be for operating uh, into the capital side, buying a uh, uh, number of items. And, and the things you've seen us uh, implement over the last eight years, most of them were funded in many ways by uh, local local funds, our local, what we call positive budget variants. So we're at the end of the road. Uh, now's the time to go back and let's find some capital and seek to improve this, be a safer system, be a faster system, and be more on time. Thank you. Go ahead, Darvel. Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> you can use Hello? this one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I, you know, I, I could echo everything that Leanne and TJ have said with regards to our capital needs. I think it's important to point out that while CTA is 70 years old, our system is 125 years old. Um, and there are portions of our system that have not had the type of capital investment that is necessary for decades. Um, we've been very fortunate uh, under the leadership of, of the current mayor uh, to have invested over $8 billion in capital improvements uh, over the, over the fa past several years. And that has certainly, I think, shown a return on investment. Uh, if you look at areas around Morgan Station, for example, you can see how that community has just taken off. And it started at the time that we made the investment in the station at that location. Um, and we're going to continue to invest. But the truth of the matter is, as Leanne and, and TJ indicated, um, we're running out of rabbits to pull out of the hat. I, uh, I spent my entire career in transit at both the federal and at the local level, and I pretty much know every funding and financing trick uh, that you can use, uh, having seen it at both the national level and here locally. Uh, and we've been very innovative in our approach to funding. We've had transit TIFs that are funding one of the biggest capital improvement projects in the history of CTA, the $1.2 billion repro modernization project. We're using a ride hailing fee currently to fund uh, infrastructure improvements and safety improvements to our system. But what we really need is a long-term, sustainable, dependable funding source that can allow us to plan appropriately for the funding needs that we have going forward. Thank you all. Prior to becoming an executive director, I spent um, the last 22 years in the mechanical department, so I'm very close to uh, being the proud owner-operator right now of the oldest passenger fleet in the entire country. When I uh, go out and speak with our peers, because that's where you're going to learn a lot of the lessons, both on the funding side and the infrastructure side, they really are in awe when I talk about the rolling stock that we run out here and the fact that they retired that years and years ago. And I said, I know we bought it from you. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, had to find innovative ways on a continual basis to um, We've had to find innovative ways on a continual basis to do a lot with a little. Uh, we don't have the ability to, like uh, Dorval has there with some of the funding mechanisms and the trips that, uh, the tricks that he's learned over the years. Um, but at the end of the day, it's maybe our own um, fault that we've continued to survive and excel with very little. The time now, like, like it says, is two to three billion dollars a year to get us back to a state of good repair, to get us back to, but it's not even yet touching on what this city needs, which is growth. And so it's a bigger part of a conversation. When, when uh, TJ talks about 10 years capital, 10 years capital, that doesn't help any of us. It's gotta be every year. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your opening remarks. So now let's get into our discussion. Um, so the good news, we don't know if it's good news yet, but um, it, we hope it will be good news, is that there is discussion of a financing package, um, hopefully uh, being advanced in Springfield next year for transportation. Uh, there's certainly <clears throat> some folks talking about that. Now, while we recognize there is a large maintenance backlog that needs to be addressed as documented in the Invest in Transit report, Voters also want to see modernization, innovation, and improvements. What improvements and innovation can riders expect if new revenue is secured? How can we show legislators that the funds will be used to truly modernize and innovate the system? Can I just start? And then I'll let these guys talk about some of the specifics. One thing about the strategic plan that we... It is. It's just not working. Um, <laughs> There we go. Uh, I can be loud, so um, as anyone who knows me knows. Um, the, the, the plan actually put together a list of priority projects, and that may not seem like a big deal, but this is the first time this region, all four, the three operators, all four agencies came together and agreed on a list of priority projects. With a lot of the capital, traditional investment into the existing infrastructure, you get a lot of those improvements and innovations and upgrades, and I'll let these guys talk a little bit more about some of those specifics. Okay. I can. I can start. <laughs> Am I the old? No. Yeah, I can start. 
start so um, a couple weeks ago at Metro here, we just actually pulled off the uh, street an RFP for a new car design. Um, actually, it was an existing car design, a design that went back to 1940s. And uh, part of the um, reason for doing that was to take a look at the fact that innovation what really wasn't being brought forth. I recently was around some of the other transit agencies in the country and seen some of the other different things that they have. Uh, also recently, we've had um, uh, overcrowding issues on one of our business lines, the Burlington. The infrastructure right now, the yards, they can only handle so many cars. The uh, depot downtown only can handle so many cars. The track can only, only handle so many cars. How do you move more people? You put more seats in the train. So that's one of the big reasons why we said it's time to move forward and change away from that old design. Service well for 70 years. I've got a team of people out right now um, meeting uh, with uh, other agencies, talking to the maintenance people, and talking about what went right with their last purchases, what went wrong, what would you change, what could you do differently, and how does this affect your fleet when you have a mixed fleet. So innovation is clearly uh, one of my drivers. It's, it's constantly not looking at what we've done. We clearly know if we continue to do what we do every year, disinvestment into the system, we know where it's heading. We just saw the pictures. But now when we can invest in the system, for a rider's perspective, I, I anticipate, like on our rolling stock, bringing in new and more passenger friendly type vehicles. Secondly, um, on the locomotive side, um, AC traction, uh, if that doesn't mean anything to anybody, there's a thing called DC traction and AC traction. AC traction is what's called modern. Um, AC traction is the way to go. It brings the reliability to the locomotive that completely changes the game. When we talk to our freight partners, and we're very good partners with six of the big class ones, they don't allow their DC traction motor locomotives to operate north of Arkansas for the reasons of the winter. And here we are operating every winter using that DC traction. One last example is the last time the state invested in us $585 million in 2009, we basically finished the replacement of the entire Metro Electric fleet. When we did that, we changed that all from DC traction to AC traction. In 2016, we had 12 mechanical delays. So we won't get a lot of Twitter feeds on that one. In 2017, we had eight. In those two years, we ran out 90,000 trains. So when you invest in the right technology and use innovation, you're gonna get a return on that investment. Well, when you have a system that's 125 years old, just about anything you do will be modernization. Um, uh, but the, the reality is that, that um, we are very focused on improving the technology and innovation around the capital improvements that we're making. And you can see that in terms of the work that we've done currently and in that's in the already on our system, the, the bus tracker and the rail tracker um, uh, communication system that we have today. Um, you look at, at the features that we offer um, in our buses and vehicles in terms of next, spot, next bus stop um, uh, information and, and the automated um, station information that you hear on a regular basis. Um, you look at, at what we're planning in terms of future stations and future rail cars, which are really going to show what you can do in terms of innovation, in terms of improved customer signage, improved customer features, uh, the types of things that ultimately we know that our customers want and expect in the type of service that we provide to them. Um, and when you look at the, the architectural and other work that we've already done on the stations that currently have been built, uh, you look at Wilson Station, you look at Washington Wabash, which was built by CMAC for us. Um, if you look at Morgan, um, CERMAC, you can see the commitment that we're making to modernizing and upgrading our stations throughout the system uh, as we continue to do an overall modernization effort for the city. If I have one mic that works. Uh, if I was a state legislator, I would say, what are you guys doing? Are you, are you using our money properly? We give you the money. And I want to give some very specific examples of how we're doing that. Uh, the Ventra system. Ventra system started out with CTA. Uh, we knocked on the door and said, can we get in? They said, sure, come on in. And uh, Ventra did the same thing. So we have a, a combined system of the Ventra fare payment system. Uh, we recently went through a reorganization of services in the uh, North Cook Evanston uh, uh, Skokie area. It's an area both CTA and PACE work on. Staffs work together. 
and uh, came up with a, a solution that, that works in that area, and we're implementing it now. Uh, we are talking to CTA, they're going out for fare boxes, and we're talking about with them about being a part of that program to be, uh, to buy fare boxes with them, so we're coordinating on that. The, uh, uh, the big one, uh, interesting enough is for PACE, is IDOT and the tollway. Uh, tollway just uh, inv invested $260 million in a bus lane on I-90, and we've invested uh, money in that too. So we are working together, working together very closely. I think there's probably a bunch more of examples of where we sit down and work together and make the use of best use of our money. So if I was a state legislator, I'd say, okay, show me more of that. And I think we're prepared to show the state legislature more of that, of using the money that comes from all of you and using it in a way that we don't create our own separate empires. We, uh, we work together and we've got a lot more good ideas, I think, uh, for the future. Oh, yeah, traffic signal priority. Uh, that's coming to town and for buses. And that, that is an RTA took that and said, okay, we want you to all work together. So we're gonna have the same equipment on CTA buses and, and PACE buses, and it's gonna work very well for us and help speed up the system. There's a lot of little things that are happening, but they're happening in cooperation, and that's what I think the legislature wants. Yeah, the first time that, uh, that Transit signal Transit. priority. Okay, thank you so much. Um, next question is, um, we hear a lot of talk about placemaking, transit-oriented development. How can the transit agencies help transit serve as a tool for placemaking to turn stations into community assets that are safe, vibrant, connected to the communities? And what is your role in improving station areas and increasing transit-oriented development? Well, for Metra, uh, we have several stations. We're currently working with New Lenox. Cary's going to happen later this year. Glenview, we have a lot of success stories where we worked with the communities and re really redeveloped that downtown station area. And they've taken it upon themselves to turn that into a vibrant area. There, there's, we have 242 stations. Not every one of those is a success. But the ones that are success, I think we can help facilitate that conversation between any community that's heading in that direction in a community that has successfully been there. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier a uh, number of stations that CTA has recently built uh, that were basically transit community focused. Um, Wilson Station, for example, not only did we rebuild the, the station itself, but we also rebuilt <coughs> the historic station that is now going to hold a, a community grocery store in it. Um, I'm very much a firm believer that our transit stations are not just for taking people from point A to point B, but to connect to the communities that they serve in. Um, and we work very close with the community, not only on, the, on the, the improvements we make to those stations, but things such as art that we add to the station. Uh, we look to create open spaces around our stations that community can use for various community activities. And you're going to see more of that, uh, not just with the stage we built, but you're gonna see that at Garfield uh, on the Green Line. You're going to see that at Cottage Grove on the Green Line. They're both projects that we are just now starting uh, to work on that are, that are going to show that type of activity. We've also seen a type of, of uh, transit-oriented development occur around our stations. I mentioned Borgman earlier, uh, where we've seen a, a tremendous growth in, in the, the restaurants and retail and other uh, businesses that have come out of that area. Uh, we've also seen it at Cermak on the Green Line, um, uh, where you've seen that same type of development around the area that it's in. And so what we do know is that when you invest in transit, you are invested in the communities. And by definition, that is almost a community-oriented development in and of itself. Um, but the return on that investment is also in important and critical to driving the type of, of private development that you're looking for um, uh, that ultimately feeds those communities as those investments go forward. Um. Latest example for PACE is uh, opening up on August 13th, the Barrington Road uh, I-90 Express Bus Station. That, uh, that is going to turn a area that really wasn't transit uh, into an area that is transit. And uh, we work with Hoffman Estates, work with the tollway, and I think IDOT's in there in the middle of that too somewhere. 
Uh, and that's opening up on August 13th. Those of you who drive I 90 may see that uh, ped crossing, uh, that pedestrian walkway uh, that's to the east of the uh, intersection, and that's uh, PACE. And that will connect on both sides, and there's a lot of redevelopment occurring in that area, a lot of uh, empty uh, office space. I think there's a million square feet, but a little bit to the north that's uh, being redeveloped. It's going to be a big deal, and uh, it's going to make a place, and transit's going to be part of it. I think we've got a really good foundation, and they gave some good examples of some of the stuff, but we need to double down on that. I think we need to do that on steroids, and I think we need to sort of spread the world word around the region. RTA has done a lot to do the early planning phases of sort of local municipalities. We all know in Illinois we love our units of local government, and the practical reality is none of us here get to control the actual land use decisions that are happening in and around our transit station, around the transit station. So it's sort of some of its education and laying the foundation for that planning. But I also think thinking beyond that, um, how do we even uh, capture the value of the investments from, uh, of transit into, uh, and use that to sort of reinvest back into the transit system and development in and around. And I think we need to be thinking more about in terms of partnerships, not just sort of being an anchor or, or sort of a hub for development, but actually sort of fully integrating it. And uh, surprise, surprise, I grew up in Australia. Uh, and you can see examples. I mean, Australia is not by any means the Hong Kong examples of the world in transit. But, you know, there's examples of transit stations that you don't even, you can't see. They're literally inside. They're built, they've built in, above, around, up and below. And the transit system <coughs> is sort of that anchor in that network. But there's commercial, there's residential, there's, you know, educational facilities. They're all built up in and around. And I think we've got some great assets here. And we should be sort of leveraging those even further as we think and get more creative going forward. Right. The Thompson Center is probably the closest thing we can think of where there's a station in the basement and then it goes right into an, an office building. But, yeah, great example. So, so there have been some truly innovative approaches to planning, to transit planning that we've seen in some of the other regions uh, recently. In L.A., um, they developed a first and last mile strategic plan. Um, there have been complete overhauls of the bus route systems in Baltimore and Houston, uh, and with Houston being one of the only systems that increased bus ridership after they did that. Um, and there has been the establishment in, uh, by LA Metro of the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, and that word extraordinary is very important. Uh, and they're accepting unsolicited proposals from the private sector. What types of planning innovation would you like to see happen in this region? Well, I think that, um, first of all, we are being innovative. I don't want to start with the premise that innovation isn't happening in, in our region. Uh, you, you know, TJ mentioned the Ventra app um, a minute ago, but the Ventra Fair Media System is one of the most innovative systems in the country. Uh, we're one of the first in the country to actually implement that type of fair media system. I'd add the world, because I've actually had Australians, yes. because it's actually account-based and nobody has that kind of system. And right. people are coming here to talk to CTA about how you implement that around the world. Right. So, so there is innovation happening even as we speak. The challenge around innovation, of course, is money uh, and having the, the resources to ultimately support the new innovation that, that we want to pursue. Having said that, you know, projects like Looplink, which are basically you know, providing bus rapid transit services um, throughout the city. Uh, signal prioritization that TJ mentioned earlier uh, is being expanded throughout the city to allow us to work to serve certain corridors much faster for both PACE and CTA uh, in ways that we haven't uh, been able to do before. Um, I think that, that the opportunities for innovation going forward uh, are going to include not just bus but rail. Um, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the transportation network that exists in this city. Um, part of the issue is how do you connect that network up? Um, you've got Divi Bike, you've got Rideshare, you've got CTA, you've got Metro, you've got Pace. CTA, Metro, and Pace are pretty much hooked together. Um, but ultimately, what the consumer wants is the easy access to basically pick among multiple platforms uh, to meet their various needs over whatever period of time that they're pursuing uh, their transportation decision making around. And I think that part of being in a position to provide that is both the reliability question for us, which comes back to investment and in infrastructure, but
but it's also a technology question in terms of providing the type of technology that will allow for that seamless uh, interaction. We are currently in the process of integrating Divi Bike into our Ventra app. Um, I think our Ventra app platform will form the basis for those opportunities with not only Divi app, but also with Uber, Lyft, and others, so that at some point in time, you're able to pick up one app, seamlessly make decisions about various transportation options, and just like Google Maps will lay out your various options to get from point A to point B, you'll be able to do the same thing with public transportation uh, and make what will be the best decision for you as a consumer. What makes this city so great is that we have so many options available to us. And one of those options has to be public transportation, or else the city does not survive. And just to add on, um, I mean, a little bit different with, uh, with, like Dorval says, the rail. We don't get to turn right and turn left if there's traffic ahead of us. So it's infrastructure. For us, it's complete infrastructure. Um, to meet the needs, and, and basically in our world, we're, we're competing with the automobile. Um, we're not really competing with TJ. He's actually helping getting more cars off the roads to help reduce congestion. But we're, we're competing with an automobile, and that's the only thing we can offer there is time. We clearly have an um, environmental footprint that's far less than 1,000 people in their car. When we put 1,000 people on a train, we probably don't tout that enough. But it's infrastructure. And when you talk about a railroad's infrastructure, you're talking about adding track. And adding track means putting track sideways and putting more crossovers in. And for some communities, this is a very hard lift. But once again, um, to meet the needs of the future, we actually have to start really looking at the infrastructure and not just the current infrastructure if we're going to really meet the need. We've been listening a lot re recently to the, the business groups and the, the new workforce that's coming in. And they have a lot of different needs and desires and the way they want to get around uh, the, the bike, the mobility, uh, not owning a car. And for us to be part of that solution and listening to those businesses about where those people want to live and where they want to commute to and from, it's not necessarily the standard traditional way of coming down to the central business district to work. Some of them now are starting in a lot of the big cities to commute away from the central business district but yet live downtown in the vibrant nightlife and the community life that's down here now. So we have to continue to listen, but at the end of the day, the infrastructure is really one of the biggest things that has to change. Do you have I was just going to add that we, we talked a little bit about sort of the, the regional relationship between transit. Transit is ultimately the backbone. And, you know, I meet with Springfield legislators, congressional legislators, and they're sort of, there's, there's a bit of a theme that, you know, transit's old school, it's, it's going by the wayside, there's autonomous vehicles that are coming to save the day. We need to own and make sure that we un have everybody understand that the, the public transportation network is the backbone, it's the spine. You could platoon all the autonomous vehicles in the world together down the Kennedy and the Jane Adams, and you'll never get the throughput or the amount of people through that that you can with transit. And you know, it's, it's, we will sink or swim as a region by the value and the, the improvements in our transit system. Right. Indeed, transit is what makes the region possible to even be a region. We, we could not be this dense if transit didn't exist. Um, let's springboard off a couple of the comments that were made earlier uh, about fair payment systems. And you, you reference mo kind of mobility as a service and fully integrated um, fair payment systems, not only for transit, but for other modes. Um, one question is, how can we make sure that people can travel between transit modes very seamlessly? You know, currently, to transfer between pa uh, Metra and either PACE or CTA, they need to pay a separate fare. Um, is there, how can this region move towards having fully integrated fares um, and, and simple fares for riders? <laughs> All right. Uh, transit fares, I'm going to just say two things about transit fares. They do two things. One is they raise revenue, and the other thing they do is they control use. So as a transit operator, want to raise revenue, but also if there's cases where just tremendous overcrowding, uh, don't have the resources, uh, one of the uses in the private industry when I was in that was uh, you would raise fares and uh, you would uh, eliminate your overcrowding. Now, obviously, that isn't what we're going to do here, but there are two uses for that. 
But what I want to say this about integration affairs. Uh, how we move people from the closed system of PACE and CTA to the open system of METRA, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about, and I don't think we have the answer. Uh, but I want to say this, don't limit this to just transit. Uh, if, uh, if, and don't just limit it to fixed route transit because we are working to, to integrate the Ventra fare system with our paratransit system, our ADA system, our call and ride type systems. Also, I think you have to think bigger and try and integrate it with parking and get it in that. And the final one, which I think is absolutely necessary, is that we need to have our employers offer transit as a pre-tax benefit right on your payroll check. And uh, the same way you do with your, your health benefits uh, for paying your uh, deductibles on your health insurance where you have a little credit card, I imagine most people, a lot of people do, that really needs to happen with transit because we, we can get the partnership with the employers to provide this integration direct, simple, easy, happens automatically. I think that is, that my, my experience is that that's a great thing. And I've had experience with that. So please, uh, let's not just limit it to trying to solve the problem, how we move back and forth between a, a open system such as uh, Metra and a closed system such as PACE and CTA. We, we need to include other people. Integration of fair system has to be far more than just public transit. It has to include all modes of transportation. And I think we're talking Bibby as well. I guess I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, I made news. Um, <laughs> I think that, that for those of us who have been you know, involved in transportation and transit in this region for a few decades, uh, we've come a long way. Uh, I can remember when Metro, CJ, and PACE had completely separate fare model um, programs that did not interact in any way at all. We now can put it all on one app, and basically as a customer, you can move freely between CTA, Metro, and Pace um, uh, through the app uh, that you never were able to do before. Um, I agree with TJ that fundamentally, the fare question is also a budget question which we all independently have to address and deal with as we meet the overall obligations that we have f fiscally to the region. Um, and you know, while we spend a lot of time talking about the capital side of our needs, I think we'd be remiss if we also didn't point out the fact on the operating side, we've also been getting hit regularly and consistently for the past couple of years. Um, we're not just maintaining our operating subsidy, we've been losing it. Um, and in an environment when that, where that is happening, in addition to the capital disinvestment that's occurring, you are creating a perfect scenario and it's not a pretty one. Um, uh, when we have the type of operating subsidy that we can rely on and depend on and it continues to grow at a rate that one would reasonably expect, then the ability to have conversations about fair integration and other things become a lot easier than when we're all basically facing our own fiscal budget challenges and trying to make sure that we can continue operating the service that we're currently providing. Um, and so I think if we're going to have a conversation more fair integration. It has to be in a conjunction with a conversation about the subsidies that support the operating side of our budget. Yeah, I totally agree that, that really the conversation starts not with uh, this is what we like, but how, you can, how can we afford this? At the end of the day, all of these modes of transportation uh, cost money to operate and they cost money to maintain and they certainly cost money to grow. And in, in the commuter world, and I just went out and met with a bunch of our peers, they're all exactly the same. It's distance space for us because the farther you go, the more the infrastructure you have to maintain, and, and that's really the model that's used throughout the country within commuters. So it's a good conversation to have, but it's, it's literally about the, the balance sheet at the end of the year of how, how do you afford this. Okay. Um, let's... Uh talk just for a moment about bus rapid transit. So CMAP, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, um, is got its draft long range plan out uh, for comment right now. And on the list of projects includes uh, a network of bus rapid transit for CTA as well as for, for PACE. Uh, when can we anticipate um, seeing development of those systems? 
Well, first of all, and, and I assume this is a question just to pay some CTA. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna lay off the hook. You, you get um, to take a trust. break. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to make very clear that I believe and support bus rapid transit. Uh, I think it is something that is an integral part of the bus options that the city needs, uh, that the region needs. Um, and we have not walked away from that commitment. Um, uh, I have taken an approach that has allowed for us to, con to move forward in terms of express bus service and other things in certain corridors, signal prioritization and things of that nature that are sort of the baby steps of getting to bus rapid transit. Um, it's not the platinum or gold standard of bus rapid transit. Um, but I think the ability to pursue that feeds right back into the bigger conversation we're having about a capital program. Um, there are certainly corridors that I think currently have the density and the capacity to support a bus rapid transit uh, system. Uh, but our ability to pursue that right now is extremely limited by the fiscal realities of what our capital budge budget and program look like. Uh, and so, you know, where we can, Pace and I have Pace and CTA, rather, have worked collectively to improve service on certain corridors that allow uh, for more rapid bus service than we currently have. Signal prioritization has been a big part of that conversation. Uh, we work very closely with the city in terms of upgrading traffic signals to allow uh, for that opportunity to occur. Um, but even in that case, the city's, you know, the city's ability to do that is once again dependent on capital funding to support infrastructure. So we're all sort of seeing the same tune here about time, but I don't think there's any diminishment of the desire to want to pursue a bus rapid transit network that would support the region the way um, uh, we have a rail system that supports it now. Mm -hmm. Do we let Pace talk? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, we're, we're doing it incrementally. Uh, this is gonna sound silly, but the first, first thing we have to do is we have to have bus stops. So we have a, mm -hmm. a number of routes that we're converting to designated bus stops. It used to be you'd stand on the corner and wave at the bus driver, and the bus driver would, would stop for you if it was safe. And uh, then you'd get into an argument with the bus driver why you went another block. And it was, anyway, we're getting rid of that. We're going to bu designated bus stops. That'll speed things up a little bit. Second thing, of course, is traffic signal priority. Uh, we'll have about 250 intersections operational in 12 months and then there's another 150 that are gonna be online too. So that speeds things up. A uh, year from now, we will have our first pulse system, which is a limited stop, mixed traffic. Uh, you can call it bus rapid transit. It's not an exclusive lane on Milwaukee from Jeff Park, uh, basically the Gulf Mill Shopping Center. That's the first one. We're learning how to do this. It's only seven miles, we're learning how to do it. We've got Dempster uh, under study. Uh, we're looking at uh, Halstead, Roosevelt, Harlem, Harlem uh, are, the, are the next ones in line, and uh, that's all in our capital program. It's just a matter of funding it. So those, th those things, the answer is yes, we're, are we doing it yet? Yes, we are. I-55, <laughs> bus on shoulders, uh, ridership up, up three or four times what it was before. Once again, August, uh, I think it's August 13th, we're opening up a 450 uh, car park and ride lot in uh, Plainfield at the very far west end of the I-55 corridor uh, for service that goes to downtown Chicago. Uh, and then of course, the uh, bus lanes, we don't use them that often on I-90 because they did such a wonderful job of reconstructing it. There's very little congestion on I-90. Uh, that is another bus uh, rapid transit, if you want to call it express uh, service. And then we just opened up bus on shoulders on I-94, basically from Foster up to about uh, Dundee. And uh, that, that serves that whole Lake Cook uh, uh, corridor. And so we, we are doing these things. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, of getting it done, and when you deal with 260 communities and IDOT and Cook County uh, and, uh, and, and all the other counties we have to deal with, everybody has their building regulations, everybody has uh, their, their rules, and we have to follow every one of them. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this in that I-90 corridor, Cook County played a big role in helping uh, us uh, work on the uh, Rosemont uh, 
uh, transit center, the, the bus portion of that, and that's been uh, rebuilt and completely rebuilt. So a lot of good things happening. Oh, and Joliet. Joliet's going to finish up a bus terminal there at the uh, rail station in downtown Joliet. We're going to fund it. They're going to do it. And that will connect to the high-speed rail, which takes you all the way downtown. And IDOT just funded a uh, study to look at how can we provide express bus services out of uh, downtown Joliet to the western part of, uh, of northeastern Illinois. A lot of things just happening, and, uh, and it's kind of fun. All right. Um, so let's uh, move on to, I got one or two more, and then we'll move on to the questions from the, from the audience. Um, we've seen, and this is probably TJ again, um, we've seen increased uh, interest in demand for paratransit, and that's um, transit service for people with disabilities that live within three quarters of a mile of um, PACE or CTA. A metro is not uh, included by federal regulation in paratransit. But we see that uh, that demand for that service increasing, partly due to an aging population. Uh, how can we uh, move forward in this region in terms of not only serving that demand for paratransit, but getting towards universal mobility uh, throughout the region? How can we do that? Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Leanne? Yeah, and <laughs> because I think, I think, I think probably wants to jump in about yeah. the <laughs> but, I mean, but Actually, okay. well-timed question, because we, every uh, twice a year, all four agencies get together, Metro included, who doesn't actually have some of these obligations, to sit and talk about paratransit and ADA services across the region. And we don't just sort of limit ourselves just to that very specific niche of conversation. How do we talk about accessibility and mobility across the entire region? Everything from universal design of pavements and curb cuts and and then more importantly, access to stations, and more importantly, access to mainline transit stations and the rest of the rolling stock. One of the spaces that the RTA plays in is sort of this travel training mobility coordination space in helping people, as, especially as our population ages, uh, making sure that we are educating uh, seniors and other groups on how to access the mainline system to so hopefully stave off some of the growth in paratransit so people don't necessarily automatically default to some of that. Uh, and, but some of this also does take capital investment um, and sort of balancing out the operating cost increases with the capital investment. I think Dorval's probably jumping a bit to talk about some of the station improvement plans that you've got on the books. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, I think it's very timely to mention this topic right now because just last week, CTA announced its all station accessibility program, which is intended to basically complete the process of making all of our rail stations 100% accessible in 20 years. Um, we currently have more accessible stations than any other legacy system in the country, um, but we know that that's not enough. Um, Leanne is absolutely right that the big issue for sort of getting over that last hump, the last about 20%, is money. Um, but we recognize that in order to basically create the basis for the advocacy for the funding, we had to put forth a plan on what we would do and how we would do it. Um, and a good portion of that is, is tied into existing capital programs that we're pursuing, like Red Purple Modernization, which will also modernize, along with the stations for the phrase one of that, will also make them accessible. But it's also about finding the other discrete money that we need to make the other stations accessible, accessible as well. And so we are working with the disability community, with other advocates um, uh, for mobility, uh, to basically use the plan as a blueprint to get us to 100% accessibility faster than any other legacy system in the country. Um, and that's our goal that we're trying to achieve. Fantastic. I, I'm just curious with Metro, I know you talked about some um, new rail car orders. Is that going to provide benefits, um, more like level boarding opportunities? Yeah, close to level boarding. Okay. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is the uh, design of a car that actually has uh, boarding about eight inches up. So you won't have to be uh, lifted into the car if you're in a power chair, wheelchair, something of that nature, um, that, that five steps right now. Um, that's the way a, a few of the other cities go. But I'm leaving it wide open uh, to innovation. Maybe there's something that we haven't even figured out yet uh, with regard to getting as close to level boarding as we could. OK, fantastic. Um, all right, so let's let's switch over to questions from our audience. I have a whole pile of cards that have come in while we've been chatting, um, and and certainly the theme throughout the day has been the need for funding, and uh, to 
get all these ideas actually implemented, um, and that's no small task. Um, so what this question asks, to gain greater, greater support for a capital bill, how can transit engage contractors, business leaders, workforce development advocates, labor unions, and downtown business owners in support of increased funding? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Let me just, well, one, one thing that we need to do is better publicize what we do. Um, I have someone who told me that bad news travels everywhere, good news travels nowhere. There's a lot of good stuff that we're doing that appeals to all those interests that you just talked about that are natural allies for transit and support for transit investment. We have to get our story out there to let them understand it, to know it, so they understand why advocating for us is in their interest. Uh, clearly, the, the video that RTA put together is the beginning of that effort, but there are so many other nuanced aspects of that that we can talk about that are just great things that we have undergoing, taking right now, which is why investing in transit matters. Um, I haven't mentioned my Second Chance program, which is, a, which is a tremendous program designed to provide ex-felons an opportunity to be employed and to get the type of job training that they need to hold on to permanent jobs. That's not something I do because it's important to me to move people from point A to point B. It's something that I do because I believe in the community that we serve, as all of us do, and we believe that in investing in transit, you're also investing in your community, and we really need to get that message out there particularly to those groups who can understand why if you get us money for transit, you will be the beneficiary of that. Leanne? And to build on that, I think uh, we're already doing a lot of that. I mean, we've already engaged conversations with Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce and starting to lay that foundation of sort of what the issues are, because some people actually don't even know the issues, and that's sort of the foundation of that video, but to build from there and uh, build support amongst different constituencies. I firmly believe that sometimes we asking both the public and taxpayers and legislators sort of for more money sometimes sounds a little self-serving. It sounds like we're trying to build our empire, maybe we can't trust them, we're not quite sure what they're doing with it. <laughs> I think other people telling our story is far more compelling and almost sometimes when you're telling the story, it shouldn't, and I keep saying this over and over again, not about bridges and, and rails and buses and trains, it should be about quality of life, access to job, this jobs. This region has some really good things going for, for it. It's really come out of the recession pretty well. I think we've got, you know, talented workforce that employers, we see it over and over again, are looking to locate here. We need to sort of engage those conversations. Um, you know, I've spoken to the Young Professionals Network, for example, to sort of try to pick out a few people that want to be spokespeople for some of these issues on behalf of all of us as we go forward. So this is really the starting point of an ongoing conversation, education, and really building that foundation of support to have other people sort of telling our story and making the pitch for us to some extent. We're happy to tell your story here at MEC. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, we have to talk about it, Uber and Lyft. Um, I think we all know that there has been tremendous, uh, tremendous spike in the ridership in transportation network companies, Uber and Lyft in particular, over recent years, and that at the same time, transit ridership has decreased. Um, what is your view uh, moving forward in how to stay competitive? I think we're affected differently by Uber and Lyft because of the distance that we move. For us, Uber and Lyft looks to be more of a partnership in that first mile, last mile, especially in the suburbs out there where the roads aren't as congested and you can get around. Our numbers right now show that uh, our discretionary riders are where we're losing ridership, which is going to be those evening riders potentially that have a, now I can go 12 miles in 12 minutes versus the 25 minute train ride. So the options are, are it's once again to, to time. But when it comes to the uh, outer points for us, um, I think Uber and Lyft really is a partnership and we shouldn't look at them as uh, adversaries. Should it be a way to get to the train station? Train station should be developed where it's almost that kiss and ride, but you don't kiss the Uber driver. <laughs> um, I, have, I have described the relationship between Uber, Lyft, and CTA as complicated. <laughs> um, we are impacted in a different way than Metra is in terms of this issue because we don't have a, a big last mile, uh, first mile challenge. Um, the way our system is designed and the way our, our, our system operates, uh, we provide that level of geographic coverage throughout the city. However, there's no question that there are areas of the city that, that could 
benefit from and, and get more service um, uh, from Uber and Lyft than they can necessarily get from CTA. I think the, the, the real issue for us is that we have to find a way to coexist. The one thing that I do know, and you can see this any time that CTA has a meltdown, as you were pointing out from your, from your slide earlier, when our service melts down, Uber and Lyft are not picking up all the people. They can't. The capacity that CTA has to move large numbers of people from point A to point B throughout the city cannot be matched by any other option that's available without creating a level of congestion that will completely shut down the city. So the question is, and this is a broader policy question that really comes back to the communities that we operate in, what kind of community do you want? How do you want these options to coexist? What are the rules to play in the sandbox? And from my perspective, as we figure that out, you will then be in a much better position to provide the litany of transportation options that ultimately everybody wants. What I will say is that Uber and Lyft are not going away. They're here. Our job is to innovate and to adjust to deal with the reality of the community that we serve today and not become a dinosaur. Um, and that's what I'm committed to do. Now, we know that the city just recently increased fees on Uber and Lyft and it transferred those resources to CTA. Have you heard of any other or other discussions of any other pricing strategies to help transit compete um, better in certain transit quarters? Here in Chicago? Yes. No. <laughs> Are there examples from other places that you would like to see in Chicago? Um, I, I actually think that Chicago has probably been on the cutting edge of that particular topic. Um, uh, we were the first in the country to create a, a ride hailing fee that was dedicated to transit, um, which was also, I think, a recognition by, by the city of the importance of the benefit that Uber and Lyft get from having a robust transit system in a city like this. Um, um, I, I think that, you know, going forward, the conversation really needs to start to develop around the operation of the various systems. Um, I'm a big proponent of prioritizing transit for special events and other activities as a way to basically support transit use uh, for activities where you know trying to get everybody in their car down to, to a particular you know, venue like Lollapalooza is going to be a challenge. Um, those are the types of things that I think are going to benefit us as a whole, as a community. Um, I don't know from a fundraising standpoint what I should or could expect from, from ride hailing companies themselves. Um, I think it's much more of an integration conversation at this point and figuring out what's the best way to operate collectively as a group. Uh, one of the unexpected consequences of Uber and Lyft is an interesting one. Uh, just recently at our board meeting, we approved a contract with 10 different taxi cab companies to help us uh, provide ADA uh, para and other paratransit services. I can tell you that 10 years ago, uh, we did not have that kind of interest from the taxi cab companies in providing this service. So it's given us an additional resource in many respects to, uh, in a very controlled environment, because as we know, the taxi cab services are, are pretty controlled, uh, we're able now to utilize them in ways that will improve our paratransit services, help when we have overloads, uh, help when uh, we have very uh, low demand, uh, help in corridors where we need help. So it, it's an interesting thing. It's, it, it, it appears to have uh, uh, opened up PACE as a possible market for uh, taxi cab operators because they can do what we need to have done, which is really good control on the operators and where those vehicles are and the fares. So just to close on that point, I think one of the things that you've heard from the three CEOs is this is not one size fits all in terms of sort of solutions, answers, how do we deal with this? And it's a bigger, broader policy think that we collectively, um, beyond the transit agencies, have to have. Um, I think that in the downtown urban core, there's a little bit more of a regulatory control organization piece. Some of that's already played out with the pricing uh, conversation. But you know, what's old is new. Should we be thinking about to you know, drop off pickup locations, especially either around special events and or in some of these really congested areas so it's not sort of the random 
you know, Prius from northwest Indiana pulls up to a <laughs> curb, three doors open, and all these people pile out. Uh, at least a cab, you know that that might happen. Um, but, and they're stopping, you know, we've got photos of Ubers parked in the, the bus lanes and, and things like that. But so it's, that there's potentially a control, a regulatory piece in the downtown urban cause, in the suburban environment, it's the partnership. I think it's getting everybody to the table uh, that we have to continue that dialogue about how do we work in this, I refer to it as a sort of a very symbiotic relationship. Um, and I think we need to collectively across the entire region need to push forward in some of those difficult, um, you know, sometimes clashing um, perspectives, uh, but bring everyone to the table and think through how do we survive together and ad take advantage of the benefits, the resources and the investments that have already been mm -hmm. made. And I loved an earlier comment you made of what is, what's the region we want to live in and then, and then move back from there and set policy to achieve that. Um, so we talk, we're talking about the region. Let's talk about an even bigger region. Um, our region goes even into Indiana um, from the standpoint of uh, MPO, there's another MPO right across the border. And um, NICD, the, the uh, commuter rail uh, goes between Indiana and Chicago. The Indiana and Illinois state line creates a barrier for funding, but we share an urbanized area and population. Can you comment on cross-state transit connectivity into Northwest Indiana? Well, at this point in time, there's, there's clearly um, Indiana residents uh, coming on the South Shore, uh, Nick D, and they're coming into the city, and there's clearly some Indiana residents that actually come over the border, park at the Hegwood Station, <coughs> which is in Illinois, and then um, come in there. Um, the Westlake Corridor is, is what they're trying to build and fund. Uh, it's going to go down into uh, Dyer and they're going to try to um, provide um, some transit services in that area. It's, um, it's kind of an older area, meaning it's kind of already developed. It's not really the, the growing area, although there's a, there's a shift in demographics of maybe um, you know, people who live there because of the fact that I've seen some changes in the schools over there. Being from Indiana, I kind of follow this. but. Um, the, the Metro Electric, uh, where we run right in parallel with them, clearly, clearly is, is a concern of ours. Um, uh, we don't want to see transit, uh, including the three of us sitting up here, competing against each other. It should be a win-win-win. It shouldn't be, I took yours. And so with Indiana, it, it's a conversation we have with NICD all the time. Um, they also have Valpo buses that are coming in now. I know there's um, Gary buses coming in. so. There are people ways finding other options. Uh, I think one of the biggest things is that flexibility that people are looking for. Your standard five day a week downtown commute rider doesn't exist like it used to. They're, they're diminishing in numbers. And because of that, people's patterns have changed and they make different options based on their experience. Helpful. Um, so let's talk a little bit about energy sources. Um, in particular, CTA recently has announced its plan to add to its electric bus fleet. Uh, is there a date uh, or a plan to convert the entire fleet? That, that's a good question. And actually, we are in the process of starting to develop that plan. Um, as you can imagine, converting a fleet from fuel to electric is a very complicated process, not just because it's not just about buying the vehicles, it's also about the infrastructure that supports the vehicles, um, as well as the, the employees and other facilities that have to basically maintain those vehicles. Um, what I have directed staff to do is to basically bring in uh, some outside help to help us develop a, a roadmap that would allow us to achieve that so that we have a strategic approach to how we would do that and we can integrate that into our overall capital budget planning as we go forward. Uh, as a broad overall vision and goal, the answer is yes. Um, I believe that electric buses are the future of transportation, um, but the time frame and the strategy about how we will accomplish that is something that we still have to put together, uh, but we're beginning that process. And let's hear from Pace, too. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess it's two weeks ago. Uh, we, we just completed the conversion of, uh, of our south uh, garage, which is in Markham, operate 100 buses, they're all CNG. Uh, that conversion took about three years, and that's our first one. The second one we're trying to do is uh, replace our northwest garage in Des Plaines with a CNG uh, garage and replace that fleet too. The, uh, my background's engineering. I'm a civil engineer, but I, I uh, I was a maintenance director at the age of 29. So that gives you an idea. 
what my background is similar to Jim's. The, uh, the choice between CNG and, and, uh, and electric is, is a tough one. Uh, ultimately, you need to be at electric. You need to be at a non-carbon fueled uh, uh, vehicle. The, uh, the latest uh, CNG engines out of Cummins are near zero emissions, and uh, they, they are very competitive with electric. Electric buses need to lose some weight. Uh, they, they're pretty heavy, and they're also pretty expensive. So from limited capital, uh, for now, we're looking at uh, CNG. But uh, if you ever want to get in a conversation with me, uh, Illinois really needs to be electric. The whole state needs to be electric. It would be a, an electric experience if we had <laughs> it. it uh, we, we don't have any petroleum, but we've got a lot of wind power, and uh, we've got a lot of nuclear power, and we sure as heck should be using it locally. That's my pitch on, on energy. And I think carbon-based fuels are really detrimental to uh, the future of the planet. Can I, can I make just one generic point real yeah. quick? And I hope that everyone is picking up on this in the, in the presentation we're doing today. Um, I've been in the transportation industry for over 30 years, and I spent all of it here in Chicago. Uh, I can tell you that the relationship that exists between RTA, CTA, Metro, and PACE is better than I have ever experienced it in my entire career. And a big part of our ability to be successful in everything that we're talking about is the ability of the four of us to work together, to be able to communicate with each other, and to basically get along as a group. Leanne made the point earlier about the prioritization of our capital program for the first time in as long as I can remember. That comes because we are at a point in our relationships where we can have the kind of trust that allows us to engage in that conversation. And to a certain degree, our overall success, which I think we all recognize, to deliver on what we're talking about here as a region, comes from our ability as a group to be able to deliver on the transportation objectives that we're trying to meet here in the region. And so if you take anything away from this event, I hope you take away the fact that as you see all of us talk and interact amongst ourselves, that this is real amongst all four of us, uh, and we're all legally committed to delivering on the promise of improving transit in this region. Great point. We're thrilled to have you all here today. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about access um, for people with disabilities. Uh, we know that uh, I think every bus, PACE, and CTA is wheelchair uh, accessible. The challenge, in more so for PACE than for CTA, is access to those bus stops. Uh, as it, we see often a pole planted where there's a lot of grass and there isn't a sidewalk. Um, what is the, what is being done to make more pedestrian access or wheelchair access to those stops so people don't need to use paratransit and they can get on the fixed route bus system? That's, that's a tough one because we do serve 260 communities and uh, five counties or six or whatever the <laughs> heck it is. And, uh, and then we have IDOT as well. So uh, every one of those right-of-ways are controlled by somebody else. And every time we put in a bus stop shelter, we have to get a permit. And that permit to put in a bus stop shelter could take a year. Uh, and it may be in an area that doesn't have a sidewalk. And then we have to decide how do we deal with that? Uh, we will not put in a bus stop shelter that's not, not, not accessible. I mean, that's the modern way you do things. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't really a matter for discussion. Uh, that's just a standard. That's just the way, it ha the way it is. That's the standard we have now, and it's been that way for, what, 30 years now? Uh, it's time to realize that's what we are going to do. Uh, sidewalks are a problem in the suburbs. Uh, that's just the developers didn't want to put in sidewalks because it cost extra money and used right-of-ways and they wanted to have housing that was cheap and uh, or cheaper and so they didn't put in sidewalks now we got to go back and retrofit and uh, that gets back to the old M-O-N-E-Y issue if you got the money uh, we can put in the sidewalks it's just a matter of, uh, of, of making that kind of commitment I will add that highway and municipal um, so the highway departments have 
become much more enlightened. I mean, I've, I've, my background's in planning. I started on the municipal side. I've done the roadside, and now I'm doing the transit side. You know, early in my career, I was literally told by a very high-ranking highway engineer, look here, Missy, we don't do sidewalks. We're talking about the road here. <laughs> There's, you know, we want to, you know, so they didn't, they did the road, they put in the, the four lanes, arterial, turn lanes, everything else, and the municipality came back a year later and spent, you know, three and a half million on this small stretch of sidewalk. It would have been much cheaper for everybody to just do it at the same time. I think we've come a long way. I dot the county highway departments are much more enlightened in the thinking about sort of how you do all this stuff comprehensively. But there's a lot of catch up we still have to do. Sure. Um, so a couple more questions. Uh, these, these are, there are two related questions uh, about equity. Uh, so what plans are there are around access, equitable access to Metra where no other rail service exists? For example, on the southeast side of the city where Metra is too expensive for most residents. So fair, fares are more expensive on Metra than on CTA. Um, in some cases, that's the only or the best rail option, but people may not access it because of the fare. Is there, is there any plan for the future in terms of that? Well, before I hand it over to Jim, yes. let, me, let me make a pitch for one of my projects, uh, which is the extension of the red line to 130th Street. Um, <laughs> um, we certainly recognize that our rail system does not serve the southeast side of the city the way we would like to. And um, uh, I have made the investment in my capital budget to begin the environmental and development process for a new extension to that, um, uh, for that line uh, that will provide a new rail option in that area of the city um, that we think will help support the transportation needs for people who are trying to get from that part of the city, particularly into downtown Chicago. Um, uh, I can tell you that we're still, you know, more than a few years away from making that a reality, um, but I know that there are a lot of people who didn't believe, because this has been discussed probably for as long as I've been in transit, uh, that we would do it. Um, but as a, as a fellow South Sider myself, uh, I felt it was important for equity and other reasons that we pursue this as a very real project. And it is, along with the Red Purple Modernization Project, the two major capital investment projects that we are pursuing uh, at this point in time. Well, thanks for preemptively answering another question. <laughs> Well, for Metro, obviously, um, we have very robust service, actually, on uh, Metro Electric District. We run uh, about the most amount of trains uh, uh, for any line. Service during the rush hours is uh, very robust. And, and so it's back to the time consideration. Are we providing time against the vehicle? Or are people choosing to use the vehicle? There certainly is some places where you have to consider that maybe the price of the ticket has actually driven some of our riders away. What we've done recently uh, was uh, collapse one of our outermost zones uh, past 40 miles. So that's up in actually McHenry County as an experiment. Uh, it's 1% of our ridership. It was 12% loss over the last two years in that particular zone. So this will be a key performance indicator to the board to, to consider whether or not that prices are driving away some of the passengers. It, it all still boils down to the bottom line, which is volume. Um, if you put, if we had a lower fare, we have to increase the volume by that much more. And if we can't increase the volume, uh, lowering the fare just rides the, uh, rises the subsidy so much higher, which for us, we have 11 different lines. It presses down on the services that we ha we'd be able to provide on the other lines. It's still back to the economic model about the recovery ratio and what we have to support on a balanced budget. We, uh, Dorval and I, have uh, had a few conversations uh, in advance of his uh, <coughs> other rail line um, of possible some, some solutions that may uh, tie the two systems together, um, but back to that uh, open system, closed system, and how that uh, payment goes to support the actual service that's running. That, that's still the question Dorval and I and Leanne and TJ will jump in eventually, but <laughs> TJ supports us out at the outer points by, uh, by uh, delivering passengers to some of our stations in many of our different areas. This is more about that specific part of the uh, community. All right, well, we're almost done, but I'm gonna let you each um, tell us what are you most excited about for transit in the future in Chicago? I'll start. Um, 
At, at the end of the day, um, Chicago has a world-class uh, transit system. You talk to some of our peers, you go to some of these other parts of the country, and they, they are just, they want what we have. In LA, they'll pay up to a billion dollars just to get one mile of light rail line. That's what they want. We have it. it it's, the exciting part is, it's been 10 years, so maybe the 10-year clock's about to flip on us and give us <laughs> another capital investment, but the key is it can't be these every 10-year investments. It's got to be a conversation about doing the right thing to invest in transit for the long-term future. We can't budget and plan these great projects and great innovation and grow the system if we can't actually see the money continually coming in. Down in Atlanta, 71 percent, they actually uh, voted the, led, uh, the electorate voted and said, we want to raise our taxes because we want to invest in transit. It takes leadership, and it's going to take leadership from not the people here. It's going to take leadership from Springfield, and it's going to take leadership from the federal side to say, what's this investment going to look like? Where's it going to come from? Because at the end of the day, we all support it. That's why you're here. We all pay for it because you already pay taxes. But the fact is we're not paying enough to grow it. We're not paying enough to sustain it. And right now it is, it is time. So I'm excited because it is time. Uh, realistically, when you look at everything that's happening right now, everything's pointing toward a solution has to come. And I think with the support that you have here, uh, uh, meetings like this that continue, we've been out with the mayors and managers and telling our story. I know the RTA has as well. We've been down to Springfield. We've certainly been in Washington telling our story, telling the good news and, and the things we're trying to do, and also talking about what it could look like or what we could do with it. And unfortunately, we do have a little bit of dysfunction in a couple of our governments. And, <laughs> and until we get that there, and, I, and once again, I think like Leanne said, it can't be our voice. It can't be our voice. Um, the new, you know, the Twitters and the Facebooks, it may be that part of the voice, but it may even be a bigger part of the voice. The legislators, the people that have to, to stand strong right now to provide that, that source of funding to us through whatever mechanisms that they come up with. It's not going to just grow out of the ground. We're not going to find oil. <laughs> Illinois has got some serious problems right now that have to be rectified. But Chicago is a great place because most of our infrastructure is already here. It's just now time to rebuild it. Um, I, I would echo everything that Jim said. Uh, and I've, in fact, have made many of the same points myself and remarks that I've given. Uh, I'm excited about the potential benefits to the communities that we serve from the conversation that we're having. Um, I, I have always firmly believed that transit is about the community. It's not just about moving people. And the investments that we can make and the impact that that can have, particularly on communities that are in desperate need of development and support, are what excite me about the future. Uh, and to be able to be a part of that, to be able to help support the type of economic growth that I think we want to continue to see as a city, uh, and see those benefits go to those communities that need that opportunity the most is what I'm excited about pursuing. The uh, Dorval pointed out earlier about how we all talk to each other and, and the capital plan that's before you is, an, is I think an excellent example of that. My, my excitement is about the fact that uh, I think we're in a good position to have a safer system and to make the investments that make it a safer system I think we're in an excellent position to make it a faster system because it's all about speed in many respects. Uh, that's what we need. And then the final one for the person that's standing on the corner in 20 degrees, I think we got a real good chance of making this system more on time. I have a system that the service is there when we say it's going to be there, and if it's not there, we've got an alternative uh, that uh, that picks people up or does something. So I think we're right on the cusp of being safer, faster, and uh, more on time. And we do that, uh, we're going to have more writers than we know what to do with. So to wrap up, I'll bring it up to an even higher level. All of everything that was said, but more. I think what I'm excited about is the leadership and, and sort of the, I think, the fortitude that this region has. We've got a strong economy. We've got a job base that's growing and good. We've got a talented workforce. We have strong leaders who are ready to step up and say, you know, and, and challenge some of the status quo and say, we have to take some of these matters into our own hands. We know the state is broke. We know the federal government's looking to sort of potentially even pull further out of investing in infrastructure. 
contrary to some rhetoric that some leaders have. Uh, so I think we as a region, where's the success been around the country? The LA example, the Philly example, the Georgia example. Local um, initiatives taking matters into their own hands and saying we need to step up and we need to make an investment into our infrastructure in our region. That goes beyond transit. We, this state survives based on the regional economic driver of you know, the Chicago metropolitan area. I think we have to recognize that, we have to talk about that, we have to have a very real conversation, continuing about what it costs to invest in this infrastructure and how to support it and maintain it, not just from a capital standpoint, but from an operating standpoint as well. And I think if we don't want to have that conversation as a region, this is a conversation I'm having with lots of elected officials, is if we don't want to have that conversation, Dorville alluded to this, it's a different future we have to be talking about. You can't just turn the light switch on and off on investment in infrastructure. It's sort of a steady decline. We've gotten to this breaking point. We need to, you know, even if all the money flew in, started flowing in tomorrow, you can't just Im immediately turn it all back on. We've got to have this deep, serious policy conversation about what we want our future to look like from a policy standpoint, from a funding standpoint, and really take that initiative and build from there. Fantastic. Well, we'd like to thank you not only for being here today, but for your incredibly hard work. We know your jobs are 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and you keep us moving in Chicago. So thank you so much, and thank you for being here today.